Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ninth session of Star Trek October, a Star Trek Adventures actual play. We are set in the year 2414 aboard a specialized starbase that has been constructed in the far reaches of the Sabine Expanse. What this means is that this game is in the same quote unquote canon as Fenrir, Matahari, and Groundskeepers. Now, the one thing I would say is you don't need to have watched any of those games to appreciate and enjoy October, but you're probably going to catch a few nods and references if you do. If you are interested in playing catch up, you can find the VODs on my YouTube and most of the popular podcast solutions. Uh, let's see. Two announcements this week. Uh, first is I am doing a 12-hour stream this coming Saturday, uh, October 24th, to celebrate my birthday. Uh, I will be running a special Star Trek Adventures one-shot before I do Cyberpunk Red, in addition to gaming with people in my community. You can get the full schedule for that 12-hour stream on my Twitter, and I think I've got it in Discord as well. The second announcement is more of a reminder in that I am still doing the Extra Life campaign that is stretching on through to November 7th. And if you're interested in that sort of thing, uh, you can check out the links below the stream. And uh, I already see we have John dropping some bits. Thank you for that. Uh, oh, I guess there is sort of a third amount announcement. Um, and this is so that everybody reminds me. Uh, I am going to be doing a credits at the end of the stream so that people can be properly credited for following, subbing, bits, etc. So, uh, you know, stick around a little bit longer if you want to see your name in the lights. But let's see. Uh, I don't think I have anything else. So let's just go around and have everyone introduce themselves, uh, starting with you, Dag. Hey everybody, I'm Dag. I am your Zaldin Captain Kijwick of Deep Space October. I think it's going to be a really awesome game tonight, even though I have no idea what's happening. If you want to hang out, hit me up at Trek Nexus on Twitter. John, Seattle, Terrell, Pilot. Ready to go. Uh, my name is Matthew. I play the Chief Engineer, the Cation Lieutenant, uh, Jana, and I'm looking forward to another great game. Uh, hey guys, Aaron, uh, Eastern Canada, uh, Telerite Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Dottig, and I um, think we're going to have a smashing time. Uh, and I'm Watney. I play the Chief of Security, uh, Lieutenant Commander Stetko, the empath. All right. And with that, I am ELH, your Game Master, and let's go ahead and run that introduction. But yeah, welcome back, everybody. So something I like doing is having the players do an opening monologue. And today that's going to come from a personal log from Lieutenant Jana. Chief Engineer's personal log, Stardate 92195.7. Starbase October has picked up a fragmented distress call from beyond the Fluidic Gate. Only one word could be recompiled, Hylassa. From what I understand, they're a symbiotic race that dwells in fluidic space, but anything more than that is really for Captain Kiswick to worry about. I have more practical concerns. Everyone was thrilled by the arrival of our new ship, the Umbriel, and my engineering teams have been chomping at the bit to examine its advanced sensor suites and e-warfare systems. Now, we have precious little time to get her ready to plunge into the unknowns of fluidic space. Jaro and I are going to try to retrofit the Umbriel's engines, but Stetko has been down my throat about modifications to the phaser arrays to ensure that the beams don't diffuse in that fluidic medium. To be honest, though, I'm worried about working with Jaro on the, either project. 
even though he was under the influence of the false hydra, his accusation that he's been holding my hand for too long hit a little too close to home. And here I thought I was holding his. <laughs> he's just not the same man I knew at the Academy. It's like he's exaggerated, keeping people away by playing himself. I've tried to include him so he knows he's not alone, but having to deal with the loss of your shipmates to survive when so many of your friends didn't, he really does need to talk to a counselor. And you see that Jana pauses, raises a clawed hand and stares at it for a moment as if it is something alien and abject to him. It helps. Maybe I'm just projecting. But right now, I need him again. We don't have much time. I really shouldn't have built the aardvark in four days. Now I actually have to uphold my reputation as a miracle worker. End log. Very nice. And you may have one momentum for that log. Uh, so to sort of actually set the scene, we are going to transition to the promenade where uh, the captain, Captain Kiswick, is walking along with none other than Boothby or quote unquote Boothby. And uh, you all are sort of uh, looking out of the main windows of the promenade and you see the fluidic gate in the background, uh, nice and orange, uh, as sort of an omnipresent set piece. Uh, but Boothby sort of stops uh, next to one of the windows and says, well, it makes you wonder uh, if all that was worth it. Uh, what do you think, Captain? You think it was you think it was worth it? I don't think I really have a judgment on that right now. Hmm. Well, what you don't know is that we've been facing almost daily attacks from the other Undine. They are not happy that there's a permanent aperture into your space. Which is why um, we have to send you to deal with this distress signal, unfortunately. We don't have the resources right now to figure out what the hell is going on. I understand. I've been looking for an opportunity to take the Umbriel out. I didn't expect her first mission to go into fluidic space, but I mm. think we can handle it. Well, she did fine on the short transition from Deep Space August to here, so I would imagine you have a good crew under your hands. I do, and the retrofitting that they're doing to the engines should definitely be useful. What can you tell us about these people in this region of fluidic space, the Hylasa? Yeah, the Hylasa. And he actually looks a little bit annoyed, but not like angry annoyed. Uh, if anything, he's just like, let us let me put it this way. He looks like a, an old man that has both regrets and an opinion, and he's trying to figure out which to express at the moment. And eventually he says, let's just say the quote unquote lie that we were the only ones in fluidic space that's not exactly true. The Hylasa have not been around as long enough, as long as us, but they are um, denizens, just like your denizens of this plane of existence, I guess is how I would put it. Have your people encountered them often? Yes, and I will admit that it has not been very pleasant. And I say that as being an Undine, the groundskeepers, we've done our best to, shall we say, mend bridges, but we haven't been very successful. Well, we'll have to keep our eyes out for the renegade Undine. Any, uh, speaking of them, any forward progress on diplomatic overtures? And he almost grimaces at that and says, unfortunately, no, if anything, things have gotten worse. What do they seem to want? Besides closing the aperture, of course. But is it just Xeno communication with Starfleet? Let's just say that the other Undine are xenophobic to the point that even your Tholians would be like, damn, cool, calm down. And Kiswick will arch an impressive eyebrow uh, to that regard. Understood. Well, I wish your people well. Uh, good luck in, in your journeys and conflicts. And uh, we'll let you know what happens in fluidic space. See that you do. And with that, we're going to transition to the Bridge of the Umbriel. 
where uh, Jana and Terrell are currently reviewing upgrades and changes to the Umbreal's engines and control systems. So what I was thinking is we could install some sort of toggle, something that would take us from supporting normal space to supporting fluidic space. What do you think? Well, I like the idea in theory, but I found that oftentimes it's like that like multi-vector assault mode on the Prometheus class. The more that you add into a system, the more there is to fail. Yeah, oh, that multi-vector assault mode is just gimmick anyway. Um, so you're wanting to just switch it full over and, and do this each time, or are you wanting to make it like dual mode? Well, I think that we can uh, we can basically design a series of modular components like we did with the Aardvark, right? The Aardvark has those various different modules that you can attach, the extra phaser power couplings and the like, uh, just like Stedco wanted. We can do the same thing for this ship to make mod modification, well, a rather simple process when we're in space dock. Hmm. That's true. So, you know, flip on and off with, with work. Yeah, the, the only the only problem I have with that is if we come out from fluidic space, let's say we travel somewhere using the portal and we come out on the other side and we need to switch back to normal mode. How do you how do you think we'd do that? Hmm. Now, you do have a point. The versatility of being able to switch back and forth between a fluidic operation, let's say, and even that might be useful if we were had to take some kind of aquatic mission, right? Exactly. I mean, I can only imagine what it's like to fly in fluidic space. It'd be like swimming in jello. Yeah, it's it's more like a submarine than a spaceship at that point. Exactly. And you know, I mean, you know, I've always said I could I could steer anything that flies, but swims? That might be a stretch. I haven't I haven't actually ever piloted underwater. Hmm. We could take inspiration from the Starship Voyager. I remember that they modified their Delta Flyer to operate in an aqueous environment. And they also had those, those amazing futuristic, well, I guess it's not really future to us anymore. Why don't we have ablative armor generators on all our ships now? What, what happened to us that we, we didn't get that? that, that, that that's, the, that's the side point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, modification to the ship, right. Um, similar process. We have some mm -hmm. kind of ablative generator that modifies the ship so that it can operate in fluidic space. No, I, 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 I think that'd be really cool. Uh, you know, and if anybody could do it, you know, the duo can do it. Oh, and hey, um, you don't think everybody was upset about what happened, are you? I, look, Jaro, um, I don't think anyone was upset with you. We were upset more for you. I mean, how are you doing with that? There was, seemed like there was a lot of built up resentment that was coming out there. You know, it, it, it wasn't, holy cow. Oh, wow, hello. <laughs> Way to go, legend. Uh, nice. <laughs> and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, it's just one of those things where, I mean, you're you're my brother, man. I I wouldn't I wouldn't I don't think that way. I really don't. I look, I believe you. I, I've never felt that way from you or that you thought I was a hindrance, you had to hold my hand. But that anger that comes from somewhere. And I think it's entirely justified. Maybe that's something you have to think about dealing with. And it's it's nothing. Uh, so anyway, back to uh, the modifications. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, aesthetics wise, I think it'd be really cool to have something that, you know, uh, not not like a button. I want something that I like I grab a handle and like shift it upward you know jaro when it comes to like 
phasers and fisticuffs, you're one of the bravest people I've ever met. Maybe that's because you're also kind of one of the stupidest people I've ever met in that respect, just because you have no sense of self-preservation. But my point is, you're not a coward. So don't try to run away from something. Oh, so you really do want a button? It, it's a classic, but that's not really what I was talking about. That's that's you kind of running away again. I, I, uh, oh shit! And uh, something sparks under his uh, under his console. Oh, never, never. Okay. And you'll see Jonah gets up from the station, walks over to Jaro's side, and he puts his hand on his shoulder and he says, "Listen, you don't have to talk to me about this." I won't press the issue anymore, but holding this in isn't healthy for you, man. You you should think about talking to somebody who can help you. Well, this like there's nobody to really talk to on DSO. Well, once again, you do have me, but if you're not comfortable with that, isn't uh, isn't the captain's wife like a, a counselor or something? Yeah, but that's the captain's wife. You yeah, know? well, from what I understand, husbands and wives don't tell each other anything, so it's certainly not going to get back to them. It's like it—it it just doesn't work, you know. It's like talking to your bartender about your alcoholism problem. Wouldn't that be the exact person you want to talk to about your alcoholism? No, no, because the bartender is going to give you more alcohol. I, this this metaphor is kind of breaking down for me. I'm not following you at all. All right, well. You know, we got a lot of work to do. Um, you know, you know the the Ardvark. My God, I still regret that name. Um, but you know, the Ardvark set a standard. We've got to we've got to press forward. I mean, I had other names, but none of them really fit at the moment. They were too Jaro, if you know what I mean. Oh, I, I thought they would be too pretentious, but uh, that's that's certainly not Jaro. Um, no. Uh, what What were you thinking? Oh, no. No, no, not going there. Okay, fine. One of one of them was the cat's meow, though. Oh, that's 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 kind of sweet and offensive at the same time. So, well, you know, actually, it has nothing to do with cats. Okay, I'm I'm going to leave that as it stands because I don't understand how the cat's meow can have nothing to do with cats. It's a human thing, probably. Oh, it is. Do you, do you want to explain? Because I'll, I'll give you the floor. I mean, pressing matter it, of distress, it, modifying the shift it's, buttons. It's, it's best that you consult the computer later. We've got a lot of work to do. Okay. Yeah, levers, then, lever for full switch, not a button. Oh, and on that note, we're going to transition away. But real quick, I did want to say thank you to chat. You guys are gifting subs and bits, and we actually have a level five hype train going, which is pretty sweet. Thank you so much for that. But uh, speaking of fun scenes, not that the scenes haven't been fun up to this point, but I think you all will really love this one. We move to the uh, main security room where a certain Klingon is having it out with our security officer, Stetko. And uh, I'm going to let you two decide what it is exactly uh, our cord son of Borch is yelling at Stetko about. So, did I win? Uh, do you think being detained in the security office is a win? If so, then yes. Ah, victory. Oh, God. Look, Cord, you can't just go around to the establishments trying to challenge the proprietors to, to sword fights. You just can't do that here. I don't understand. How else are we supposed to get time together? You can make an appointment if you need to talk to me about anything professional. Uh, 
All right. As the humans say, I'm going to go for broke. Would you like to be my Parmakai? <laughs> Cord, this is like the third time I've ever spoken to you. I know. I'm sorry it took me this long. Well, the answer is no. I see. What what sort of like empathic read would she be getting right now? Um, Why don't you roll for me because I want to give you a <laughs> uh, control command difficulty of one. Oh, God. Okay. Um, <laughs> forensic science. Sure. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah, you get your success. You, Cord, what are you feeling right now, buddy? Determined. Ugh. I understand. I am not but a humble freighter captain. I don't captain a mighty warship, but I am a warrior. And I must show you my heart. Don't you feel like incredibly embarrassed to be around me after I put you in your place? Embarrassment is a human emotion. But honor, that's what I mean. Honor is following your heart with passion, regardless of where it takes you. Living house? life to the fullest. That is honor. What house did you say you were from again? I've never heard You've of it. You've never heard of it. It's a very small... Well, if you must know, it's a house of one. How does one become a house of one? By having all the rest of your family die in the war with the Federation. Then why on earth are you interested in a Starfleet officer? I am confused. Is this some kind of jest? Why would I not be interested in one of the mighty warriors who vanquished everybody I'm related to by blood? Because it's weird. You are a perplexing female, Steko. Now you sound like a Ferengi. Your words, they cut deeper than any Batleth ever could. All right, all right. There's no need to be dramatic. I just need you to stop challenging the proprietors of the businesses on the promenade to fights. Okay, this is becoming more than a civil issue. <sighs> Besides, you're losing all of them anyway. That isn't my recollection. How drunk are you right now? Uh, compared to what? Compared to a Zaldan. Zaldan? You mean those babies that didn't even have the guts to fight when the rest of their federation did? You better watch your mouth around here. <laughs> I fear no Zaldan nor any other sentient. Send them to me and I will put them in their place. Okay, my question was how drunk are you? <laughs> I'd like to spend two threat that court as you say that. There's a sudden bark from behind you from one of the golden retrievers on the station and it scares the living shit out of you. Ah! The, has that thing always been there? Oh, it's a puppy. Come that was a, a puppy. 
That was a war cry, not a (laughs) cry of fear. I was prepared to engage in deadly battle. She's going to, um, like, kneel down and play with the dog. I'd like to flavor it the court. Maybe you wish you were the dog as we transition away. (laughs) (laughs) As we transition away to uh, actually a little bit further on. Um... You all are actually meeting in, where do I have my meeting room? Uh, Let's actually have you guys just meet on the command deck of Deep Space October um, to have everybody sort of review uh, what you're going to do, how you're going to get there, etc, etc. So, Captain, you're there. Uh, Let's see, Hatea's already there. Stetko, you're walking in. It would help if I was on the right layer. Uh, Who am I missing? I am missing Dottig, of course. And then, mostly for security's sake, uh, Jenkins is there, but I'll play Jenkins for the time being. But yeah, uh, Captain, this is your meeting on the mission you're about to undertake, so take it away. All right. Commander Hatea, I want you to stay in command of the station. Keep it on high alert, but try not to let the civilians know unless there's something major. If a rogue undine ship comes out of the vortex or if we fall under some kind of danger from something else in this area of space. I can do that, sir. No problem. All right. And Kizrik will tap a button that will replace the 3D station hologram and with a, a flight path. All right. These are the schematics and specs that uh, Boothby provided us. This shows the best path to get to the distress signal without really aggravating anybody nearby. Um, They don't know a whole lot about the people that were going in to help, but they are unable to assist as they, uh, most of their resources are caught up fighting the other Undine factions. Captain, can we assume that the people we are going to rescue are Undine? No. Uh, They are called the Hylasa. Um, They are not Undine. Uh, they apparently exist in some kind of symbiotic relationship with another creature of unknown type. But no, they are not Undine. Uh, and to my knowledge, they are not shapeshifters. Then do we have any anatomical or medical information regarding what they could potentially need? Well, to mm-hmm. anticipate that, a image of a Halasa does come up on the viewer. And you sort of see, for those who can't look at the screen right now, um, they are humanoid. Uh, they have blue mottled skin, a very large cranium that sort of stretch backs alien style. Um, very large eyes, uh, almost not quite dinner saucer level, but you know they're much more noticeable than on, they would be on your normal humanoid. And uh, very smooth skin overall. Like the, the they don't really have lines on their face so much as they have curves. This is as much as we've been provided by Undine Intelligence. So Doc. Use it to your advantage. I'll do what I can. And um, with that, Dottig will turn to um, Jana and say, Lieutenant, are the isolation chambers in sick bay up to this task? Uh, given the nature of the Luna class and its unique environmental s- control systems that allow each individual well, quarter on the uh, the ship to be uh, temperature controlled and environmental controlled um, independently, it should be fine. Uh, sick bay should be more than well prepared for any kind of well needs that these aliens might have. I don't know anything about them, so are, are, are we actually making an assumption though that they are suffering from some kind of medical ailment? Isn't that a bit presumptuous? They could be under attack. We have no idea what the actual issue is here, do we? We don't know the nature of the distress call, but we're not going to let it go by. Any allies that we can make in fluidic space will benefit both Starfleet, and it'll take pressure off the Undine, who seem to have a not-so-good relationship with them. So we'll go under, we'll go in under the guise of a, uh, this is a first contact mission, Mission of Mercy, full diplomatic extensions. And uh, if it turns south, Doc, I may need you to use uh, this, these biology readings for our benefit. 
if there's any kind of respiratory exploitation we can take advantage of. I'm sorry, are you asking me to use medical knowledge to harm? I'm asking you to use medical knowledge to save. Very good. Lieutenant Terrell, how are, what do you think of Umbriel's helm? I think Jonah and I are doing a really good job. Uh, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to uh, taking this ship for a swim. Swim, apt. Any not so good things to report? Yeah, we still can't decide between a button or a lever. Oh, how's that even a choice? It's a lever. See, Jonah? It depends just... on the button. It's so satisfying. You hear that nice little click when you push it down. Like, yeah, but when you have the lever, it's like... Uh, but the lever is dynamic. You pull it down. You feel... The... Never mind. Yeah, but you can't smash a lever. Not with that attitude. Yeah, if you smash a button, John will get mad at you. Not if it's at a particularly dramatic moment. I mean, if, if it's narratively appropriate to the situation, I mean... I mean, smashing a button is like, you know, slamming down a communicator. It and doesn't have Jenkins, an impact. It's very Jenkins satisfying. actually butts in and says, um, I, I do not wish to interrupt, but perhaps we could reach compromise. How would you feel about dial? No. <laughs> it's like the worst of both worlds. That's I would do the worst. before Dial Jenkins. Let's settle down. <laughs> Lieutenant, let's leave it to your discretion. Just make sure that the display is customizable for your relief. Lieutenant Jana, your, your report says that the Umbriel is as ready as she's going to get. Yes, sir. We've reinforced the Bussard collectors to prevent any accumulation of organic matter. And, uh, well, our warp field geometry has been calibrated to actually, well, hopefully operate inside fluidic space, but every day is an adventure when you're in Starfleet. We'll find out when we get there. We're operating on theory, sir. Well, you've got some pretty good theories. We're not the only ship that's been in fluidic space before. So standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, Stetco, weapons analysis? Uh, everything's in the green, sir. Uh, readings are nominal. I think um, we should be good in fluidic space. I just wouldn't fire torpedoes from too far away. Okay. And uh, have we moved an aardvark into Umbriel's shuttle bay? If you want it to be so, yeah, you could bring an aardvark along. We have brought one extra vehicle along, sir. Excellent. All right, people. Um, let's go. All right. So we sort of enter into a little bit of a narrative fluff here where you all leave and get aboard the Umbriel. You settle in. And uh, we sort of do an exterior shot where the Umbriel begins to leave the dock of Deep Space October. And Terrell, do you want to do anything fancy on your way to uh, the Fluidic Gate? Um, he's gonna, <clears throat> uh, he's just gonna do a quick spinning corkscrew as they're going in. Okay. Uh, let's see if it actually can get you some momentum here. Why don't you do me a control and a con, and the uh, the Umbriel can assist you with a uh, engines con. Difficulty of one. I'll spend our one moment. Okay. Well, there's one from the ship. I would really laugh, though, if you got a complication. But you don't. You get four successes. Very nice. That's three momentum. So for uh, for those of you on the ship, the view screen sort of rotates as Terrell does a uh, nice uh, roll of the ship as it goes into the orange swirling maw of the fluidic gate. And we transition from normal space to that of fluidic space. And uh, fluidic space itself, it's a swirl of greens and oranges and yellows where the rules of normal reality don't really apply. 
And immediately once you're on the other side in fluidic space, uh, what you notice are a few things. The first is that the groundskeepers uh, have a few weapons platforms set up. Uh, they are automatically sort of pinging the Umbriel, verifying who you are, um, but your computer takes care of that automatically. Um, the other thing you're noticing is that there are a myriad of uh, Undine ships, uh, ranging from your standard sort of bio ship, uh, scale 3 bio ship, all the way up to uh, a large class, uh, or not class, but a large scale 7 uh, ship that you've never seen anything like before. Um, if I were to describe it, if you will imagine almost like a pine cone that has been sort of less married with a squid. And it's this sort of, I, I hesitate to use the word fluidic again, but it's it's an organic, a fluidly organic uh, ship that you're seeing that easily is just a little bit bigger than the Umbriel. And uh, it doesn't pay you any mind. And if you were to look it up in the computers, this is Boothby's flagship that's sitting there. Things must be worse with the groundskeepers than they're letting on. To have a ship like this docked here with their fight against the other factions. Unable to respond to a simple distress call. They've got to be hurting. This is a heck of a presence. Uh, Lieutenant Terrell, send friendly messages to all groundskeepers' ships and uh, plot a course towards the distress call at the best speed possible. Uh, his friendly message is peace out. <laughs> all right. <laughs> as, they, as they head in. Okay. So uh, you begin heading in the direction uh, where this distress call came from. And we'll say maybe about 30 minutes to an hour passes so that you put the fluidic gate firmly behind you. But 30 minutes to an hour in, uh, all of you across the ship, like the engine's noise doesn't really change when you enter it into fluidic space. It was nice and constant. You know, that standard sort of engine hum that permeates the deck. But now 30 minutes to an hour in, you even if you're not an engineer, it's as if the engine is struggling. Uh, maybe it's not really, it's not this high pitched, uh, the pitch is more erratic, and I'm going to actually spend two threat here, that eventually the Umbriel comes to a full stop in fluidic space. Full stop with engines running. Correct. And would you be able to say what speed we were traveling at? Uh, that is up to Terrell. How fast would you have been going? Um, just a uh, full impulse. Okay. Okay, uh, uh, Jana, I think uh, the filter. I think the filters are mucked up. Yeah, I, I'm actually not entirely certain what's gone wrong. It it could be a, a function of fluidic space itself, which is a little bit outside my wheelhouse. But I, just give me a minute. I'm going to start investigating. And could I actually run some tests to determine what might have actually gone wrong with the ship, or if this is an external uh, force that's almost impeding us? Yeah. Uh, why don't you roll me a reason engineering? Uh, the ship will assist you with a computers in engineering. Uh, difficulty on this, uh, let's make it a two. And while you make that roll, Kiswick will ask Terrell to cut engines until we can solve this problem. No need All to right. put unnecessary strain. I have an idea, but we'll wait. See what Jana comes up with. And I know my ship gives me an extra die. Mm-hmm. No focus. Uh, let me check your focuses. Uh, actually, I'll give you I'll give you a focus here in power systems. Okay. Nice. Wow, that is already five successes. If someone wants to grab the uh, computer's engineering of the ship, I'm unable to get the ship to load in a pop out. I'll just for me. I'll just roll a d20. Okay. So that is uh, I think for the Umbriel, that's a crit too. Let me double that's check. That's two. Mm-hmm. Very nice, very nice. So that is a grand total of seven successes, which means you guys are not only capped on momentum, but you have two floating by my count. So uh, as we transition to the Bridge of the Umbriel, uh, what you're seeing, Jana, is threefold. There are three major problems right now. The first is that the Umbriel was not really designed for fancy flying. Uh, if you had to give the ship a weakness or qualify weakness, flying is it. 
it wasn't meant to do fancy maneuvering. And that's sort of reflected by your con score of a one uh, with the Umbriel. So just entering into fluidic space is already pretty taxing on it. The second thing is that even with your modifications to the collectors, the collectors are, for lack of a better term, gummed up, where they are needing some form of a purge. The problem with that, though, is that in order to purge it, you're going to also have to vent some of your warp plasma. So there might be an inventive solution there, but that's problem two. Problem three is that the hull is experiencing more pressure than you were expecting. Now, you're not pushing into the red line or anything, but it is one of those things where if you were to take a breach to structure, it would be more devastating than usual, you think. Uh, at least before the emergency bulkheads could uh, take effect. And GM question. Yes. This, this pressure persists um, even with the navigational deflectors online. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> well, Captain, uh, we have a whole host of problems. Um, I'm forwarding you a summary of my uh, findings. Uh, you should be receiving that on your console now. All right. So, John, what happens if we uh, maybe kick it in the reverse, so to speak? I'm not sure that I follow because I know nothing about piloting. Uh, I mean, I understand what reverse is, obviously, but... Uh, well, you know, we're sucking everything in, theoretically. What if we blow everything out? That would require us to essentially open up the uh, uh, the nacelles. It could work if you can pilot the ship backwards. I... <laughs> backwards? As long as you don't ask me to go sideways. I will say that this ship is not really designed for the kinds of maneuvers that you may be used to pulling off with, let's say, the how. She was a little bit more nimble. Let's try not to scratch the paint, Terrell. Flyer nice. He, he strokes the console. My baby will take care of me. If you pull that plastic vinyl up on the console, it's going to be your pip. <laughs> he slowly like pushes it back down. <laughs> Would it be possible for us to spend those two floating momentum to create an advantage whereby mm -hmm. um, the there is a system in place that allows us to purge the uh, the Bussard collectors without ejecting uh, warp plasma, so that we have actually devised as part of the system that we discussed the sort of ablative generators, something that would mm -hmm. actually fold off um, and allow us to do that almost manually. Yeah, I would say you could definitely spend the two floating momentum on that. So yeah, uh, all this is going to involve then is Terrell. I need you to do me a daring and a con. Uh, I think the difficulty here is going to be a four. Uh, but the ship will assist you with a, uh, let's do a structure and con here. All right. Well, let's, let's spend some of that beautiful momentum we have. Uh, you can say bye-bye to three of it. Okay. Actually, two of them, because I have to give you one threat to do what I'm doing. Okay. So one threat to two. Oh, he's got bold. Yes, I do. <laughs> so daring con. Mm -hmm. Anybody have Umbriel? I'll get I them. think you just volunteered. I did just refresh my page, so I can do that. What's the role? Structure and con. Con's a dump stat. Oh, there you go. You've already got the four successes you need. Can the Umbriel get you an assist? Oh, dear. And, be, and, and, oh. and can I'm I re-roll the ships? It. Can I re-roll the ships with the uh, bold? Unfortunately, no. There okay. is, at least to my knowledge, you cannot re-roll any of the assist die unless you're like the captain doing advisor kind of a thing. All right. I will roll my zero, though. Okay. Oh, okay. Can, hey, I use, can I use two momentum to offset the uh, complication? I'll let it happen. I'll let it okay. happen. Technically, by rules, you're not supposed to, but I'll let it happen. So we sort of go back to an exterior shot of the Umbriel and... So we got uh, one bonus, uh, Jonna. Yeah. 
So you uh, you sort of see the exterior of the Umbriel. The nacelles are sort of glowing bluish green. And as the Umbriel begins to move backwards, uh, venting from the nacelles is the greenish gas part or the greenish liquid part. And after about maybe 30 seconds of the ship flying in reverse, uh, you eventually see the nice pure blue of the nacelles again. All right. Jonna, is uh, there any way no, that we... No paint, no paint uh, scratched, sir. Good to know. Jonna, is there any way that we can use the sensors to determine the local density and salinity factors to configure the shields so that they may be able to help with our navigation? Uh, actually, sir, I think that Dr. Doctig is a little bit more skilled at those kinds of calculations than I am. Uh, I could certainly modify the shields if we find the right variant frequency in order to reduce pressure on the ship, but you may want to actually talk to him about what that would be. Kishwick to Dotic. Dotic here, go ahead. I hear you're a shield expert, Doc. Says who? Little bird. Well, little cat, whatever. Uh, what can I do for you? I need a quick equation on reconfiguring our tactical defense shields to compensate for the local salinity and density in fluidic space so that uh, Umbriel doesn't get gummed up as easily. Uh, it's challenging, but doable. Um, however, may I suggest an alternative? Go for it. Um, the salinity and the density of particulate matter is not uncommon in fluidic space. It's also not uncommon in an operating theater. Perhaps we can modify our shields to act as a sort of uh, sterilization field, similar to the ones we employ here in sickbay. And I thought you were going to say a laser scalpel. This isn't the 22nd century. Keep going. Well, I think if we're able to do that, we can use the shields as a filter of sorts that would allow us to pass more easily through fluidic space. All right. Send your recalibrations to Lieutenant John station on the bridge and execute at your discretion. Right. Very good. Kids so, Dottig, uh, you're going to be rolling me here uh, a reason and a science. Okay. Um, I tell you what, this is actually a good opportunity for me to point this out. Um, the Umbriel does have advanced research facilities, um, which I would say in this instance you could use uh, if you so wish. Now, what uh, advanced research facilities does is it gives you a bonus momentum that you could use to obtain information. So it's really up to you whether you want to do that sort of thing. This isn't necessarily something where you could gain extra information, but I did want to present it as an option nonetheless. Sure. Um... And, oh, right, difficulty and stuff. Uh, yeah. Let's see, the, the ship will assist you with a computers and science. Uh, the difficulty here, I'm going to spend a little bit of threat to make a difficulty of four. Okay. Um, I am going to use a, a point of momentum to okay. grab an extra D20. And, uh, GM, does the, does the bonus momentum from the, uh, advanced research labs mm -hmm. come into play? Can I obtain more information even if I don't succeed on this role? I believe so. Yes. Because it doesn't, yeah, I'm looking at it now. It does not specifically say that you have to succeed. Okay. Let's go ahead and give it a try. If somebody would be so kind as to grab the ship for me. Yep, Keswick's already, already, already got, got you set. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Oh, I, I hadn't scrolled all the way down. Um, and since we're talking about uh, biological contagions or contaminants, uh, would my focuses in either xenobiology or virology apply here? give you xenobiology. I okay. think that would apply. 
Ooh, wow. Nice. Yeah, you guys are doing really nice. That is a total of uh, six successes, uh, which means you are now at five momentum. And yeah, so Dantig, you know, you, you maybe got a D double plus in engineering principles, <laughs> but when it comes to science principles, mm -hmm. you know, you, you did pretty damn well. Uh, however, what I would say is after you're done sort of calculating everything mm -hmm. and you have a theory, you're about to send it to Jana when you realize that you think Stetco could do a better job of it. But I'm going to leave it ultimately up to you who you send it to. Well, I mean, considering it's a modification to our defense systems, I believe you're probably right that Stetco would be the person to uh, talk to. So Dottig will, will tap his comm badge and say, yeah. Dottig to Stetco. Go ahead. I'm transmitting the shield modifications now. Sounds good. Uh, and sure enough, Stetco, you get a uh, equation that can be used to amplify and modify and modulate the shields. Mm -hmm. uh, to put it into practice, though, uh, will require a bit of rolling. Okay. So Stetco, uh, this is going to be a control and a security. And uh, the ship will assist you. Let's do a let's do a structure security for the ship. And this will also be a difficulty of four. Starship security systems. I I think those definitely apply. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and thing uh, will just sort of rib Stetco and say, if uh, if any of those numbers are particularly intimidating, you just let me know. I think I've got it, Doctor. Thank you. What's I the difficulty so. again? Difficulty of four. Okay. Um, I want to buy an extra dice. Okay. So it's control security. Yep. Okay, so you do get the four successes, but there is a complication. Eight. So the engine hum returns to normal, but the side effect is that as the shields sort of uh, reinitialize into their new form, what happens is there is suddenly an immense pressure on the hull. Like, you guys have formed a bubble around the ship that's preventing uh, extra fluidic space from coming in, but you still have to deal with the already existing fluid that is between the shield and the hull. And what's happening is, is the pressure is mounting almost triple, quadruple, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll a challenge dice here. And if I roll an effect, you will actually suffer a structural breach. And every t I'm going to say this is sort of a time challenge um, until you figure out how to deal with the fluidic uh, space that is, you know, again, between shield and hull. I will be you get like one task each time and every task you do not succeed. I'm going to be rolling another challenge die. So uh, good news is no breach yet, but you're you're getting to the red line here. Sir, we have, uh, it looks like the the remainder of fluidic space between the shield and the hull is causing immense pressure, and we, we might suffer a, a, a structural breach if we don't vent it somehow. Okay, uh, let's revert the shield calibrations to normal and see if we can figure out a way to clear out some space between us and the fluidic space and then reinitialize the shield changes. Um, what if we modified the deflector beam uh, to produce a repulsion field that's polarized to fluidic spaces polarity? Basically, we have to blow our nose. Well, I was thinking the deflector dish would serve as the handkerchief on that mark. Uh, if I may, Captain, we could also open a small aperture inside the shield or the shield grid to allow the pressure to release using this deflector modification plan that you've envisioned. Having certain parts of fluidic space fly between the shields and the ship, but not pressurizing the ship inside the shields. GM, is the pressure outside the shields? more than the pressure on the hull 
Um, I would say this is actually one of those situations where it's the reverse, where the interior is more pressurized than the exterior. Okay. Almost like uh, almost like a, a real life airplane where, you know, they, they're actually like pressurized at what, I, I forget the actual pressurization, but, you know, as high as airplanes fly, they're like at point something atmosphere and they're pressurized for like one point something atmosphere. So mm -hmm. conceivably, if you opened a hull, the fluid would just sort of go out on its own. But let's just say there is risk involved. Risk is we part of the game. We need to create pressure from in from our end and find a way to release within the shields somehow. We could try to basically compress the fluidic space around the ship through a hole in the shields using the deflector array, as you mentioned. Basically squeeze the fluidic space between our deflector and our shields through an aperture in the shields that's properly calibrated. I like Wait, this idea. Worth a shot. <laughs> All right. So, as usual, I'm going to give you guys a choice. You may either have a high difficulty, high reward task, or you can have an extended task. Which would you prefer? Always high difficulty. Always high difficulty. <laughs> but I have Miracle Worker. I'm designed now to beat <laughs> extended tasks. <laughs> I don't know, well, Dottig, Stetco. I mean, you guys, uh, you guys do get a vote here. What are we voting on again? Uh, whether or not this is going to be a high difficulty, high reward single task, or if this is going to be a uh, extended task. Hey, hey, hey! No talking to the one above all on my bridge. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> I co will defer to the captain. <laughs> okay. And Dottig, for posterity, what would you say? Well, let, let Jana show off on the extended task. I'm good okay. either way. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in that case, uh, I tell you what, we haven't actually done an extended task in a while, so let's do an extended task here. So uh, I will type this out so that uh, everybody has it referenced. It's actually not that bad as far as extended tasks are concerned. It's mostly the fact that we're doing intervals of time that matters here. So the work track is going to be a 10. The magnitude is just going to be a 3. Uh, the resistance will be probably a 2. And your starting difficulty is going to be at a 4. Uh, so, uh, Jana, this is going to be a daring engineering on your part, and you may choose who assists you on this. Uh, for example, if you have Terrell doing something fancy with the engines and the con, they may assist with a daring con. If Stetko's doing something fancy with the shield specifically, uh, she may assist with a daring security. Or, uh, if someone has a better idea or has something they'd like the ship to do, I would be, uh, open to that as well. I think it makes sense for Stetco to assist, given that we're modulating the shields, opening mm -hmm. up an aperture, and trying to squeeze the fluidic space out. It, it seems reasonable that she'd be handling this. I would okay. agree. Yeah. I would yep. completely agree. So what I'm going to do is I will tap my value. Um, how else am I going to maintain my reputation as a miracle worker? <laughs> OK. Uh, and I will spend two momentum to buy an extra die. OK. And we'll see what we get. So that was a daring engineering? Uh, daring engineering, yep. And Stetco, you are a daring security. One of the best things about these moments is like, this is the time that there'd be a commercial break on TNG, but you guys actually get to see the magic happen and it's not off screen. Mm -hmm. Would improvisation apply as a focus here? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. All right, hey, that's already four successes. Stetco, can you get more momentum? Uh, six, because I spent... Uh... All right, your determination, mm -hmm. so that is already six. So are we capped at momentum? Uh, no, at the moment you are at four by my count. Yeah. I would like to spend... What's the difficulty? You can't use um, momentum on momentum it. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm assisting, okay. Yeah, yeah you're assisting, gotcha. so just the 1d20. Okay, Um, Starship Security Systems. I'm yeah, guessing. it's... Yeah, it's still the shield. So it's, definitely. Power, it's power systems. We'll just say yeah, it. I, yeah, it's basically your bread and butter. All right. Hey, we'll take that first two. So you now you are capped on momentum. Okay. And yeah, uh, John, if you want to roll me six challenge dice, please. Wow. Nice. Like, wow. 
Um, if you spend one momentum, you complete this extended task in one go. Holy. Yeah. So, uh, what happens is, Jana, your uh, claws dance across the console, and you you work with Stetko, like shouting, like, "Hey, re- relegate this pressure to this shield part of the shield grid." And Stetko, you shout something equivalent back. And after a moment, the uh, pressure on the hull goes back to not only nominal levels, but if you want, you can literally vent all the fluidic space between the shields and the hull. But I'm going to leave it up to you all whether you actually bubble the ship or not. I would put that question to the captain. Uh, Captain, we might be able to actually remove all the fluidic space that it's between our shield grid and the ship. However, that might pose some danger if the shields were to fall. All of that excess pressure would immediately, well, crash into the vessel. Make a good point, Lieutenant Jana. Keep it as it is. Uh, maintain the pressure equilibrium between the shields and the outside fluidic space. Very good, sir. As and best you can. Uh, yes. Um, and may I say, sir, that Commander Stetko, that modulation of the shields was absolutely masterful. I couldn't have done this without her. Oh, no, really, Jana, you were the miracle worker here. Well, but what Charles was it that Captain said? We stand on the Charles shoulders over of there, like. <laughs> 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 and it's actually uh, interesting that Stetko, as you're complimenting one another, uh, you actually are picking something up on the sensors. Uh, sir, I'm getting a sensor reading here. And specifically, you're seeing that there is a literal body uh, floating around outside the ship. Uh, outside the shields, I should say. Can you put it on screen, Stetko? I, sir, I recommend magnification. Your discretion. She'll right. zoom in. So outside, you see uh, one of the people you were potentially sent here to find. Uh, you see a Hylosin. And they're not in a suit or anything, but as they're sort of floating around in fluidic space, they are somewhat moving. So you think they're still... I mean, you're getting a life sign reading from them. They're just not in a ship for some reason. Based on visual observation, do they appear to be in distress? Um, let me put it this way. If you saw someone in the middle of the ocean just sort of swimming along with no ship, would you be in distress? I think I'd ask before I fished them out of the ocean to ask them what was going on. But they probably don't have a radio on them either. Mm-hmm. Is is uh, Stetco getting any sort of empathic signal? Yes, actually, you are. I was wondering to see if you were asking. Um, They're afraid. They are very, very afraid. Your assessment, Lieutenant Stetka? Commander Stetka? I'm Stetka? sensing fear, sir. We could potentially beam them along with surrounding fluidic space into a quarantine field inside sick bay. That way Excellent we don't take the fish out of water. The question is, are they afraid of us or something else? Stetko, can you scan the region to see if there are any other signs in the area? And... Uh, Put a transporter lock on our swimmer. I prefer to call it a floater, sir. <laughs> All right, Stetko, if you want to roll me a reason security, please. The ship will assist you with a sensor security. The difficulty on this is a three. And yes, you would have a focus. Okay. Um, I'll spend a momentum. Okay. All right, that's already three successes. Does the ship get you anything else? Uh, one second. Thanks. It does indeed. So uh, you're up to five momentum. Stetko, you're pretty damn sure that there's been weapons fire in the area recently. As in, let's just say because it's fluidic space, it's a little bit more easy to see the sort of after effects of a weapons fire. You're seeing that some of the surrounding fluidic space is polarized, disrupted, otherwise changed from normal. And do we know, am I able to tell what direction, if that's important, the f- weapons discharge? Uh, if at? you give me a momentum, I will answer that question. Sure. Okay. So yes, uh, you know that there is a set of coordinates 
that way, because, you know, it's space, you can be any direction, but that way, uh, there does appear to be some form of a trail of uh, weapons fire and both engines in the distance. So you have a trail you could follow. Okay. Sir, I'm still not used to the readings in fluidic space, but it does look like weapons have been discharged near this area, and I am picking up a trail in a certain direction. Two questions. Can you identify the or, uh, the nature of the weapons fire by their weapon signature? Or I want to know who, who fired those shots. And Would she know? I would say that uh, since you did spend the momentum, uh, they are Undine. Okay. They look similar to signatures from our our area of space uh, from an Undine ship. We haven't had a lot of luck figuring out what the weapon signature distinctions are between the Undine and the renegade Undine factions. So let's assume it was a bogey. Um, let's let's do what what Terrell said. Uh, beam uh, um, an amount of fluidic space into a sealed off compartment in Med Bay, and then beam our survivor into it. I'll be in Med Bay. So, yes, sir. sir, can I suggest a name for the alternate Undine? Can we call them the Undine? <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> as long as it's not the Aardvark 2. <laughs> Aardvark 2, the Aardvarkening. <laughs> All right. I'll so, yeah, we uh, we transitioned to sick bay as a uh, captain. Uh, you and Dottig sort of watch as the main operating theater uh, sort of uh, a force field materializes and in beams an amount of fluidic space along with uh, Hylasen. And once they sort of finish beaming in, uh, they sort of look around and look to you, Kijwick, and they say, um, oh, I, someone has come, finally. Um, uh, can, can you help us? I think I'm responding to your distress signal if you're the reason I'm here. I'm Captain Kijwick of the USS Umbriel, and you are? I, I am Cirque, um, not really of any one particular ship, but um, you have to help. Um, the... Um, the Undine, they, they've taken our Gelki. I'm unfamiliar with a Gelki. Is that the name of your ship? Uh, no, the, the Gelki are our, are our um, symbiotic companion. Uh, they are how we, we get around fluidic space. All right. We did detect weapons fire. Yes, they were, they were hurting the Gelki to parts unknown. I, I worried what they've done with them. How many of you are there? Are you, we only detected your life sign in this space. Well, there there were five of us, so if it was just me, and, and they the fell other silent. Four. Any chance the other four are still on the Gelki? It, it's possible, but I don't think the Undine would have really kept them alive. Kiswick to Stedko. Go ahead, sir. Scan the area for additional high loss and life science or uh, bio readings. We may have uh, casualties floating around the ship. I'll see what I can do. You're looking for up to four. Kijwick out. And yes, Stetko, what I would say is that without a roll, now that you know what you're looking for, yeah, you do find four bodies, unfortunately. Uh... The, I'm assuming the comms line is still up, and she's like, sir, I don't have good news. Understood. Um, Dr. Dodig, prepare four um, stasis chambers for our guests. Uh, a moment, Captain. Um, Mr. Serki. Yes. Do your people have any specific funerary rites that we should observe? Not particularly. Um, 
Though you may find a grizzly, we simply commit them to space or fluidic space and let their body become one with the, the reality. Would you have any objections to us taking one aboard for medical study? Roll me a presence and medicine oh difficulty God. of four. Okay. <sighs> Uh, his wig's just gonna interrupt now that's bedside manner <laughs> yeah that is bedside manner for you excuse uh, me doctor I, I, I do not think that is apt at this time Mr. Serky if you feel it is better for your people to let them become one with the reality we will leave them be and go in pursuit of your Gelki well, I'm gonna I'm gonna look to Dottic here. Are you still gonna push on, or are you gonna let it go? He's gonna shoot the captain a, a very hard look. Yeah, and uh, and uh, so you know, as you will, Captain. Um, may I see you a moment in my office, please? Pardon us, Mister Serky. Right. And, and as as he office. walks to the office, uh, Kiswick to Terrell. Terrell? Uh, yes, Captain. Um, plot a course to follow in the path of... Already the there. Uh, all right. Um, I will let you know when to engage. Stand by. Kishwick up. I'll let you know if we get close to anything. Understood. Okay, Doctor. That was highly inappropriate for a first contact. I disagree. <laughs> they said that they have no specific funerary rights. There's no reason to believe they would be offended by that request. And well, if I may, this is my sick bay. Don't go over my head here. Doctor, this is my ship, and as I'm still in command, pending uh, any of your official medical readouts on myself, I'm I'm still saying to have this command, and the sick bay is part of my ship, and first contact is part of my duties. So if and when the Hylasa accede to your request, it will be in a different situation than this. Well, I suppose I will have to wait to see if another opportunity presents itself since you have robbed me of this one. Doctor, if I may, you have a Halasa in your sick bay with your full sensors at your disposal. Yes, should I ask if it would hurt its feelings if I scanned it? You, you broke, broke deck. You broke me. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, if it consents to passive medical analyses, its feelings really are not the priority. We need to be able to know that if we can save their people in danger. I will do what I can. I know you will. You've never let me down before. I'll be on the bridge. It's where you belong. Kiswick will leave. <laughs> wow. Uh, Kiswick, I might have to tap a value called turn the other cheek. <laughs> Kiswick has to love it, though. I don't really have anything to do with that, except I'm not going to turn around and yell at my doctor when this moment, uh, when there's lives on the line. Right. All right, so I'm going to set up the next scene, and then we're going to take our break. So following the trail of weapons and engines uh, disruption in fluidic space, um, you eventually arrive. It doesn't look all that different, but you now have actual things to look at besides just the greens and orange of fluidic space. And what you're seeing is the following. So uh, you arrive in an area where there are what you're assuming are the Gekli, which I've been saying wrong this entire time. Um, the Gekli are, for lack of a better term, they are almost like pancake-like creatures where they sort of have like 
Uh, their entire body is surrounded by undulating sort of fin-like um, motions where they sort of swim through fluidic space. Um, but to use sort of a better descriptor now that I think about it, um, do you guys remember that one episode of TNG? Yeah, they looked like the where... space-dilling life forms. Yeah, so the the one where it was literally sapping the Enterprise's energy. Yep. The, the one be... where the uh, they had to cut open the Junior. dead creature. Junior, yeah. yeah. Galaxy's Child. That's, a Gal- that's what it was. I couldn't episode. remember the name of the episode. Um, the yeah. Book. So that's what the Geckley are. They are the Galaxy's Child's aliens. Um, but what's important here is that there are two Undine bioships that are more or less hurting and more or less keeping the Geckley contained. Now, to sort of describe this in mechanical terms, the Undine haven't detected you yet. I'm going to give you guys that uh, advantage here. Um, but this is sort of going to be either a stealth or a full-on combat scenario where you sort of see that orange ring around the bioships. If anything enters that orange area, the Undine are immediately alerted to that fact. So how you approach this scenario, I'm going to leave up to you all, but that is where we are going to take our 10-minute break. So stream, stick around. We'll be back in 10 minutes.
All right, and welcome back. Uh, Dag, you are in the dark, apparently. Uh, sure. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> we move ahead a little bit from where we last left off, and what's happened is everybody has gathered on the bridge. Uh, Serki, the Hylasen, uh is more hologram than actual present, uh, but they are free to move about uh, the bridge, more or less, as hologram. Uh, but everybody is there, Stetko, Kiswick, Jana, Terrell, Datig, you're all on the bridge discussing how you're going to rescue the Gekli that the Undine are more or less shepherding at the moment. All right. Stetko, I need you to keep a passive sensor lock on those Undine ships if they move in our direction. Uh, Terrell, I need you to move us away from them until we have a plan. <sighs> I'll, I'll, I'll waltz with them as long as you need me to, Captain. Very well. 
Mr. Selke, you are the resident expert on this ship about fluidic space and the Geckley. So we're looking to you to see if you have any tactical knowledge that we can use in this situation to safely recover the four Gelki that appear to be herded by these two Undine ships. Well, um, I guess I can start at the beginning. And uh, he more or less sort of moves around so that he's near the view screen. And he sort of points at it and says, uh, if you will imagine uh, the Undine used the Gekli as not raw material, but as staging points for some of their own vehicles, some of their own starships. So they see them as raw material. My they're gonna, species. They're going to oh, convert your symbiotic vessels into Undine ships. To put it simply, yes. All right. <clears throat> Go ahead. Well, this is uh, this is not uncommon, unfortunately. Um, every time we run into a uh, non. I don't even know what you would call them, but there's a faction of Undine that doesn't seem to bother with us too much these days. The groundskeepers. Huh. Okay. Uh, the groundskeepers, as you call them. They leave us alone, but the other Undine, not so much. They continue to harvest and hoard us best they can. Well, Mr. Selke, um, for the duration of this message, you can consider yourself under the protection of Starfleet and the United Federation of Planets. This isn't our traditional first contact meetup, but we hope that we can be of assistance to you and your people. Sir, and, yeah. if, if we can figure out a way to get close enough, uh, I think we can <clears throat> potentially expand the warp bubble around the, uh, the creatures out there and, you know, WTFO. That's a good idea. We still need to get close enough. Is Dottig on the bridge or is he in medical? Yeah, he's on the bridge. Okay. Dottig, earlier we were having a problem with the fluidic space buildup in pressure between the ship and the shields when we recalibrated the shields to move through the fluidic space. We created the apertures to create sort of a venting solution to keep the pressure neutral while we move through the space. What if we intentionally built up the pressure again and closed off those apertures? Do you think that we would be able to use the fluidic space as a camouflage to appear indistinct on the Undine sensor ships? Hard to say, but theoretically, I believe it may be possible with the uh, sufficient concentrations of uh, particulate matter. All right, get to work on how much we need. Uh, Stetco, can you prepare two crybabies? Oh, I'd love to, sir. I need both of them going in opposite directions, ventral and dorsal from Umbriel. And don't let them transmit until they hit 5,000 meters. Make sure they're loud. All right. We want any signal they send to be way more interesting than any imperfections in our camouflage. Sir, may I suggest a little bit further than 5,000 meters? Stedko, the that's range pretty, at your discretion. That's pretty close. 50,000 meters? I'd say 50, yes. Uh, 50. Mr. Serki, yes. do your, do your Geckley emit any sort of um, echolocation sonar something that we can use to modify the crybabies to trick the undine into thinking there are more if they are so fixated on herding them wherever they are then conceivably they wouldn't bulk at the opportunity to get a couple of more that's um not a bad observation, actually. Um, yes, there's a certain uh, biorhythmic signal I could give you that would allow you to emulate the Gekli. And he'll just point at Stetko and say, well, she's, uh, she's pretty good. We've got, the best, we've got the best ship in fluidic space. 
<laughs> and correction, we have the best federation ship in fluidic space. That's true. But we also have a damn fine doctor. Mr. Serky, I'm a little perplexed about how you engage in your your symbiosis with the Gekli. Do you do you ride them? Is there a space within them? Oh, there's there's a space within them for pilots like myself. Okay. If we got close enough, we could transport you to coordinates within any one of them. Would you be able to take the reins, so to speak, if there were an emergency? I could, yeah. And it's right about now that, Jana, I'd like you to roll me an insight engineering, please. Difficulty of four. You would have a focus, but I'm not spoiling anything mm. past that. Uh, Why don't you take some of that shiny momentum? I was about to ask, could I take three <laughs> momentum to roll two extra dice for that? You sure yeah. can. This, this is the, this is the, uh, the this apex is the roll. roll. Yeah, this is the clutch roll. Nice. Five successes. So you actually oh. get a momentum back. Jana, if what you're seeing on sensors is correct, Geckley can survive outside of fluidic space. So conceivably, if you just opened up a singularity, I think you know where I'm going with this. Hmm. Uh, Captain, I, I might have another solution for us that, uh, well, it would save us the trouble of actually having to try to transport the Geckley through fluidic space to the fluidic aperture and back to Starbase October, we could actually open up a fluidic portal right on top of them and guide them back into normal space. They're How perfectly we capable of surviving there, at least from the records of the Starship Enterprise that has, I believe, encountered creatures like these before. Is that so? Mr. Serky, we might be taking your Geckley on a ride a lot farther away, but they're going to be a lot safer until a time where they can return to fluidic space. I'm okay with this. Do you mind coming along for that ride? Not at all. Can you survive outside of fluidic space? Yes. Um. Actually, I probably could be physically on the bridge with you right now. I'm sorry I didn't say anything earlier, but you, your we doctor didn't ask. didn't ask, so... All right. Well, um... Yeah, for the sake of, for the ease of this conversation, let's do a site to site and just have you beam here. Okay. So yeah, he, uh, the hologram sort of fizzes out and then the real Cirque materializes on the bridge and he says, oh, smells like um, a fruit that I know of. I don't know if it translates. That's okay. Deco is going to be keeping a very close eye on Mr. Cirque. And that's why I have Stetco. Yeah, the captain does smell like lemons. My body wash. I don't have a choice. It's more of a lime, I think. Yes, I was going to say lime. Yeah. Citrus right. is my preference. Certainly scent. citrus. Mm -hmm. All right, people, let's get serious for the moment. Um, Jana, prepare your calculations for opening an aperture to normal space. Stetco, are the crybabies ready to go? Do we need to roll for it, GM? Uh, I would say that uh, you could roll for them, but it's one of those you can either have it for free or you could shoot for extra momentum, but with the risk of a complication. Um, I'll just go ahead and build them. Okay. I then would yeah, think that have... like the, the ship's already kind of equipped with like a gotcha, a, a gotcha beacon or something. A class, yeah. a class, a re, just reconfigure like a class five probe to yeah. transfer yeah, something not like that. Directly bioscience or something. Yeah. Um, okay, so Stedco, you're on crybabies and sensors. Jana, you are on uh, the aperture. Doctor, I'm going to need you to monitor the shields and make sure that we uh, can beam Mr. Serky at the appropriate time. And Terrell, of course, you have the helm, which you are exceedingly good at. Any questions, anybody? All right. All right. So let's go back to this screen so we can do this uh, step at a time here. So uh, if I understand your plan correctly, 
uh, the first step we need to take is more or less creating that ghillie suit, quote unquote, uh, with the fluidic space so that you can get close enough. Um, this is going to be, I think, a Dotig and Stetko roll again. Um, this is going to be, uh, for Dotig, this is a daring, uh, daring science. Stetko, this is a daring security. The overall difficulty here is a three this time because you've already succeeded at this task. I'm lowering the difficulty from a four. And, and I'm going to let you two figure out who's assisting whom. Sure. Um, so with my talent testing a theory, mm -hmm. uh, because I've dealt with the shield modulations in fluidic space before, um, I can roll an additional d20 mm -hmm. um, on on this roll. But I'm still I'm I'm happy to assist if if Stetco can. Stetco's uh, probably would... got a higher a higher combination of stats than than Dottig does. And daring is not my forte. What I would say is that if you if you assist, you couldn't use that talent, unfortunately, yeah, because no, I, assist I is only the one. Yeah. Um. So, daring security, mm -hmm. difficulty of what? Four. Difficulty of three. Of three. Okay. Um. Do I have a value? Not to use uh, the a same. A focus, you mean? A focus. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's still shipboard tactical systems. Okay. Okay, I will assist you with. The I will roll. I'll I'll roll three, and buy okay. one. All right, that's already the three. That's five. Very nice. You get two Eight. momentum back. So yeah, Stetko okay. and Dottig working together, you are able to create the quote unquote ghillie suit, uh, where the only complication that I'm gonna introduce with threat is that every single quote unquote round that we do. I'm going to roll a challenge die, and if I roll an effect, you get a breach to structure. But this now leads to Terrell's action, where Terrell, you have an interesting scenario ahead of you. In order to get between the Undine bioship to thread the needle uh, as the crybabies, crybabies are going off, uh, I'm going to give you sort of an option of how to approach this roll. The base roll is going to be Daring and Con, and the ship will assist you with Engines Con. However, it's going to be at a modular difficulty, meaning that if you do, say, a difficulty one, then it's going to be a difficulty one for the Undine to look past the crybabies and see the Umbriel. If you do difficulty two, difficulty two, difficulty three, etc., etc., etc. So you can pick uh, a higher difficulty here to succeed at to make it difficult for the Undine. The caveat is, if you fail, they detect you immediately. So how bold do you feel like being? <laughs> oh, that was a mistake. Um, let's see. Um, <laughs> seven. Um, we're I, gonna was go thinking, I was thinking Kiswick would assist with that astro navigation. Uh, I will say you can trade the ship for Kiswick if you wish, but you only get one assist here. Actually, wait a uh, second. Kiswick, do you have advisor? Ship is probably better than me. Do I have advisor? I do not. I have veteran. Okay, yeah, then unfortunately. I, if I, you had advisor, I would let you have two sources of assist, but you don't have advisor, so. I'm going to go with a diff five. Difficulty five, okay. Which and brings it down to a four because of uh, precision maneuvering. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, so I need to get a four. I need to get four, but it'll translate to a value of five. Right. And this is just one of those things. I'm going with the high difficulty because I'm tapping the value of something to prove mm -hmm. using my determination. I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to give you two threat and spend three momentum. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. I saw that, John. I was just like, mm, no more momentum. Uh, so uh, what's the ship assisting with? Uh, they are assisting with a engines or a you know let's do a structure and con here because it's it's based on how well you handle in fluidic space. I got the ship structure and con. Is it just uh, do you, no focuses for assists, right? Uh, no, the ship actually has full focuses all the time. Oh, okay. Not that it matters because it's a con roll, but all right, that's already one. There's uh, I can count seven successes. Very nice. So you so get five, uh, six, seven. Yep. Yeah. And I'll go ahead and roll for the 
untapped. So we All right, get one so back. <laughs> I believe you actually get a total of three yep. uh, by my count. Uh, yeah, so but yeah. actually the target was four. We got seven, eight total successes. So, so you're four, at four, yeah. Four yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. All right, so we uh, we sort of go to an exterior shot as uh, I'd like to imagine that uh, Stetco, you fire off the modified class five probes uh, and they sort of go both up and down uh, from the umbriel. And immediately the Undeen uh, start to fly after the crybabies. And I'm going to let them have a chance here. They get two chances at this. And I'm spending my rest of my threat to actually give them a fighting chance here. But, uh, well, we'll see what happens. So, guys, uh, he said he's spending the rest of his threat. <laughs> All right. Oh so, this is ship attempt number one. <laughs> All right, so the first bio ship doesn't notice anything but the cryberry, crybaby. The second ship rolls a complication. So yes, what happens is the Undine, for thematic sake, get really, really close, like almost uncomfortably close. Mm -hmm. But uh, Terrell, you sort of jackknife or otherwise like lurch the Umbriel to the side and slip past them before they sort of collapse and seal that gap where you just were. And right about now, as you're uh, getting past the Undine right up to the Geckly, we now turn to Janna. So, Janna, are you going to... I picture the music for uh, the uh, starship battle in Rathacon. Yeah, not, not a bad yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, But yeah, so Janna, it's up to you now. You're opening a quantum singularity back to real space. Now, this is going to be very difficult. Uh, this is going to be a daring engineering the ship will assist you with an engine's engineering. Sure. And this will be at a difficulty of five. Um, I hate to game this so much, but Captain, could you give me your determination, please? <laughs> give me an inspiring speech, Captain. Look, Jana, I know you've never done this before, but I have never lost a bet on you you have you've got miracle worker written all over your face the entire station knows it you put together an aardvark in less than half the time that you said it would you took care of you've taken care of plenty of issues on dso this ship is not going to fail you and i know that you're not going to fail us risk is part of the game but you've beaten the odds thank you captain that actually means a great deal to me I won't let you down. And with that point of determination, I'll spend one to get two successes. And then it would be four momentum and one uh, threat to buy two extra dice. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yes, it would. Uh, then that is what I will do. And the ship is rolling what? what? Uh, I already rolled, already unfortunately. <laughs> oh, somebody already rolled. Okay. Yeah. Uh, daring engineering with experimental technology? Most definitely. Chip was one off a complication. I'm glad it didn't. Ooh, okay. So this oh. is interesting. We have five, uh, or we have uh, six on the table, six. but we have a complication. Uh, how, to, how to do the complication? Tell you what, I think I do know what I want the complication to be. So, yes, Jana, you are able to open a quantum singularity back to real space. And uh, immediately the Geckley sort of begin fleeing through the aperture. However, it is at this point that one of the Undine bioship immediately turns and begins running at you at full speed. So what I would say is that uh, the crew of the Umbriel get one action before the Undine bioship catches up. It's on sensors going, to let us know someone's chasing us. I'm going to take evasive action. Okay. So we are going to actually move into structured combat here, I suppose. Okay. So that we Wait. can potentially just buy ourselves time to get through the hole. Mm -hmm. All righty. So uh, let's see. A evasive action, if I remember correctly, is uh, you are doing a I have daring the, the con. Yeah, I have. Uh, let's see. What's the? Let's see. I yeah, have, it's a. I have pushed the limits for evasive action. Okay. So the task itself is Daring Con, difficulty of one. The ship will assist you with Structure Con. 
And uh, I believe it's like a difficulty of the attacker. It goes up by two because of push the limits. So Gary Khan and I've got structure con. Yeah, we'll we'll, uh, we'll we'll give you. Uh, we'll, yeah, we're just going to use the debt. We're just going to use the moment. Okay. And uh, and give you two threat. Of course. Hey, oh, look at that! That is a grand total of six successes. So I believe you get a grand total of five momentum back. And yeah, and we spend uh, two of it right away to not suffer the increased difficulty for attacks normally caused by evasive action. Got it. All right. So that is important because the Undeem Bioship is going to swoop in at that point and open fire on you. Uh, well, I have two threats, so I'm going to spend one of it to give them an additional die. And uh, with that additional die, they actually manage to beat you. So what happens is the Undine lances out with a fluidic space energy weapon and it impacts the Umbriel shields. And let's see, so the Umbriel is a scale 5, so it is 5 resistance off. Uh, but unfortunately, that is 1, 2, 3 effects. Each of those is... Okay, so you're going to be taking 10 damage to your shields. Uh, as the Umbriel is struck uh, by this fluidic space energy weapon. And that is enough for a breach. So your weapons actually go offline uh, momentarily uh, as the Umbriel is struck. And uh, it's still in one piece. Your shields are just barely still up. But uh, I would recommend getting the hell out are of there. Are the Geckly through the aperture? At this point, yes. And so that was the only thing I was waiting for, and now I'm blasting through the aperture myself. Okay. We're going on it like impulse or thrusters? Yeah, at this point, you are going like full impulse through the aperture. Kiswick However... Kiswick is going to order warp power to shields. Okay. Just reroute that. Stecco's going to inform the captain that weapons are down. Okay. Let's make a run for it. All right. So my question on the running, are you literally just going to warp out and pray the Undine don't follow, or are you going to close the singularity behind you? Well, I would absolutely recommend attempting to close it behind us as soon as we're through. Mm -hmm. I would have that system in place with the deflector already calibrated. Yeah. Shut the door on them. Weapons right. are off Wait, weapons are offline, but can we beam some torpedoes behind us? <laughs> yeah, I'd let it happen. <laughs> So yeah, I think that's how it'll be then, is as the Umbriel sort of fl flies uh, like a bat out of hell towards the aperture, uh, in fluidic space behind it, we sort of see uh, several uh, torpedoes beam, quantum torpedoes beam into space behind it. And the detonation of those torpedoes is enough for the Umbriel to get through the aperture and seal it behind it. And you guys are back in real space with the Geckley. Scan for any aperture reopening in this area, Stetco. Hi, sir. Ms. Mr. Serki, it seems that uh, your Geckley are in good condition. We can beam you to them at any time. You're welcome to stop at our station for resupply. Um, but we'll make sure the, to escort you wherever you need to be. Well, your, your station sounds wonderful. Uh, I'd like to see it. All right, Mr. Terrell. Plot of course to the station. Um, how fast can the Geckly travel? Warp eight, if you can manage that. Uh, Terrell's going to look, and where are we? You're uh, about three days travel at warp eight away from the station. Three days travel, sir. Take the scenic route. All right. All right. Then I think the final shot of today's session is uh, with you all sort of uh, motioning towards the Geckley or otherwise communicating with them to begin heading back towards the station. However, I would like to do one very quick funny thing where Stetco, as you sort of scan normal space to check that there's no apertures around, you detect that there's actually a Klingon barge that just happens to be in the same area of space. And you're getting a hail from that Klingon barge. 
Is, is it the, the hail? hail to... is, the, <laughs> is the call like, like bridge wide or is it just to like her console? I don't know. Cord, which is it? Oh, bridge wide. Oh, yes, it's, it's, bigger it's, go it's, home. it's bridge wide. I mean, everybody, God, everybody <laughs> must hear the words Captain, in his heart. That's we're being hailed by a Klingon vessel, but it's really not important. Not important. Yeah, no, I know, I know, I know this. Rel reaches so. over and accepts the uh, accepts the uh, the con, <laughs> the communication. Just put it on speakers. Yep, She's puts her it on eyes speaker. Are burning a laser to the back of Terrell's head. And yeah, appearing on the screen is none other than Cord. Captain, what can we do for you? Greetings, Captain Kishwick. Your appearance with these alien life forms is most unexpected. It was a rescue mission. We didn't expect you to be in this part of space uh, ah, right the... now. My calling takes me to many far-flung places not normally traveled. Understood. Can we Tell do me. anything for you? Yes, as a matter of fact, is uh, is Commander Stetko aboard? No. No. Oh, she's right here. <laughs> ah. I thought a lot about what you said. The last time we spoke. And you were right. You were right. For the moment... It seems that I am unworthy of Parmach with you. However, Captain, I, I don't think this is really the time. Captain Kiswick, matters Captain, of the there's heart. There's always time for love. <laughs> matters of the heart cannot wait. Matters of the heart care not for protocol. However, my timetable demands that I make a rendezvous in three hours. But before I go, I wish to leave you all with one of my favorite romantic songs, Movement 3 from Actun and Melota. Actun and Melota? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Ed Cord begins to sing uh, as bad as you think. And Kishwick joins him. Oh, God. And but I'm Jaro, imagining... Jaro's going to turn up the volume. <laughs> and he's going to apply and he's going to apply auto-tune. <laughs> that co has her head in her hands. This, this is horrible. And Jana's ears just flatten to the back of his skull. Oh. Yeah, I think Airplane actually, ears. Like, nodding along with the music as if it was good. Oh, and that's where we're going to end today's session. Oh, so yeah, what did have, you guys think? I was going to have uh, Stedko transmit Kiswick's uh, Klingon metal playlist to Captain Cord for, uh, oh, God. for fun. Ah, Cold Dead Gok. One of my favorites. <laughs> Uh, so what did you guys think? Was that uh, an enjoyable jaunt into fluid space? Oh, that space? was fun. Mm. Yeah, it really was. Right. Yeah. Um, we were vibing for sure. Yeah. The, um, the break gave us an opportunity to have a really cool discussion about how we wanted to engage the rescue effort. And um, yeah, I, I, this has felt super Star Trek for me. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, as promised, stream, uh, this is where I'm going to end it for... Actually, no, because I have to run the credits. So what's going to happen is, YouTube, you're going to end at the credits. Twitch, I'm actually going to preemptively get the raid going. Um, as soon as the credits end, I'm going to send you over to Choco Jacks. And uh, let's make the raid message be uh, Klingon Opera Raid. She's going to have no idea what that means, but I find it funny. But yeah, let me uh, roll those credits. <laughs>